Coach White, how you doing? Good to see you again. I'm good, man. Cavo, my guy. So I'm, I'm glad you're doing doing well and not frozen from Chicago. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, give people a little bit of a background on you. I obviously know your story because I played for you at Miami. But uh, give people a little bit of sense of who you are. Kind of you've got a fascinating story and a little bit of insight into you. Yeah. Um, so Miles White, originally from uh, the Detroit area. I uh, grew up in Livonia, Michigan. Uh, played at one, played at Michigan State, and ended up getting kicked out of school. I wish I could say it was the other way around. Like, oh, I left and hit the portal, but no, they kicked me out. So, uh, from there, went to Senatobia, Mississippi, and the junior college route in Northwest Mississippi Community College. Uh, figured out life's better with no snow, so I stayed in the South and went to Louisiana Tech. I played there for two years under Sonny Dykes, who's now the head coach at TCU. Uh, we hit it off. We were top 20 team in the country, number two offense of all time. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable team. I think there was 10 guys on that team that went to the NFL and played multiple years, which was really impressive. It just wasn't a one and done type thing. Uh, and then shoot, was able to cultivate a five-year NFL career, played three for the Packers, one for the Giants, one for the Jets. Uh, I had a cup of coffee in Tampa and then went up to Canada, our, our, our distant cousins. And it was, it was a good time, man. So I finished it off there and then dove into coaching. So I'm on my fifth year coaching. I was down in Dallas at SMU under Sunny Dykes again. We ran into each other again. I uh, was there for two years, then went to SFA, Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches, Texas, Beast, Texas, as they would say, uh, <laughs> coaching All-American. And then I, you know, inserted myself at Miami and was able to, to coach yours truly. So it was a good <laughs> deal. It's been a good time, man. I, uh, you know, you've had all this experience with, you know, elite level performers, you know, Sonny Dykes, Aaron Rodgers, Odell. What are some of the, you know, common threads or traits that a lot of these high level performers that you noticed um all carry with them uh so i think each person is different in their own unique way uh the main thing i would say is just consistent of all the i guess you'd say great people that i've been around uh i guess high achievers in their field is um i think they're all calm there's a, there's a sense of calmness and composure that they all have because as you know in football which is the main field that I've been in is, is there's a lot of hectic things that go around. Uh, things change in an instant. And so how well do you handle that change? And, and most of those guys, it was, it was like nothing, you know, uh, they were all driven. Like you have all the consistencies, like they, they have all the characteristics of, you know, they're self-motivated, self-starters, they're detailed, yada, yada, yada. But there was just a, uh, I think I thought their composure always stood out. Like just that it's, it's like they've been there a thousand times, you know? And so I thought that was really unique. But what what do you hope do you try to carry that as a as a coach, keeping that calm mindset? Because in the world of football, it can get, like you said, hectic, especially with players, emotions and coaches, emotions. How do you try to, you know, mitigate the 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 stress that a football environment can build or just athletics in general? I, I think there's always a level of stress. I think it's just being in control of your emotions. I mean, we're all you know, we're all men at this time. And so it's very, very common for a young player to be up and down and it's an emotional roller coaster, and you got to kind of help them out. Uh, but you want your older players to kind of have a sense of calamity. And then as a coach, you have to be calm at all times. I believe that's my personal philosophy. Some, you know, that might differ from somebody else's, but um, I just think that if I'm not calm, then how can they be calm? You know, and, that, and that's, it's, as a coach, you're very, very, very similar to a quarterback. And if you look at the best quarterbacks, they're, it's always like just even keel. No, never a bad play, never a good play. Same reaction on all of them. So um, I think I always keep that in the back of my mind. And then just from the sense of like as a coach, when we go through, we, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm a, I'm a wreck. Like I'm screaming. I'm doing all types of stuff. On game day, that's your day. If I got to coach you on game day, then I didn't do my job correctly. You know what I'm saying? So, and then ultimately, yeah, it's, it can be frustrating because I don't have an impact on the game, you know, but at the same time, like, I feel very confident that you guys are prepared and ready to go. So I'm going to be a sense of calamity for you guys. I'm not there to coach you up. I'm there to kind of caddy is what I would say. Like you look at Tiger Woods when he goes and golfs, the caddy's not screaming because he missed a bad shot or he made a bad shot, you know? So that's who I try to be on game day. Yeah. That calmness is, is contagious. I feel like for players, um, and coaches in general. It is funny though. I feel like game day is just, it, it can be like the tale of two worlds, especially like one, one game, everyone's calm. And then one day it's like, 
World War Three out there on the sideline. <laughs> it's just funny to look back and you know, looking back on it all. I mean, like we were freaking out about literally nothing. Like the next day. Oh, yeah. No doubt. No doubt. And I mean, like, but that's the thing when there's such high pressure moments. And I, you've heard me say this before. Like, it shows a lot of true colors. When people freak out and they're and they can't hold it hold their self together. And then that's when mistakes come. You know, like so the calmer you can be, the more uh, I think logical, you can think on the field and then those processes happen faster and faster over time. So, um, I think it's, I think it's just, it's truly important to be calm. You know what I mean? Just calm down, relax, make the play, do your thing and don't overthink it. it, it and I, I say, I don't want to sit there and act like I'm all the, like this monk who just like <laughs> has practiced being calm my whole life. That's not, certainly that's not the case. I've been, I, as a player, I was, I was the same way as a young player. I was high and low. I was emotional. When I made a play, I would be, I'd be the first one trying to hype everybody up. And then when I didn't make a play, it was a whole spectacle. But when you get older in the process, first and foremost, you see how much energy you're wasting on just your emotions. And then when you play 60 minutes, when you play 60 snaps, you just don't have the, the energy to do that. So you got to calm down. And then if you really, truly believe in next play mentality, then, all right, dang, I didn't make this play. Well, all right, cool. I made this play. I was supposed to make this play. Like, just keep it even keel because you know if you go one way or the other, the next play. So, uh, but uh, it, like I said, it's, it's very important, man. You can't get it enough uh, of just being calm, being composed, and then ultimately that's going to create a level of consistency for you. So, do you uh, do you feel like a burden or a not a stress, but almost a uh, you know a type of thing that you want to live up to, be a role model for you know mentor to young men that are in the situation that you've already been in previously as a player? I wouldn't say it's a, I wouldn't say it's a burden or a stress. I think I owe it to, I owe it to young players. You know, there was somebody before me that impre was impressionable upon me. So I want to do it the same for, for guys underneath me, you know, or the young players uh, that, that are coming next, you know, and just kind of give them some of the, the roadmap. Like, Hey, I, I hit my head on this. You should not do that. You know, versus where, you know, I think a lot of kids, it's it's unfortunate you see them and, they, and they're trying to navigate through this game of football with nobody in their corner. Uh, and so, you know, they'll bump their head and then next thing they're the superstar kid and they can't get out of their own way. And so if I can be that person to help them, you know, go from point A to point B, then it's great. You know, the, the hard part of coaching, I guess the stress of it is like if I ask you and, you know, you're a recruit and I and your first day on campus and I say, what what's your goal? You tell me the NFL. Well, that's my goal, too. And so I'm driven just like you are. And then when you when I see your actions don't lead up to it, well, now I'm stressed out because you're I, I thought we were trying to get to the NFL. Like that was the goal. So this is what it takes. And you don't want to do what it takes anymore. You know, so I think that's more that's more stressful on that side. But not it's not a burden. I don't think it's it, it is truly a joy to coach and just help people and impact their lives. Young people at that. Uh, and then just to see it when it clicks for somebody like, OK, he's getting it or or to see a kid who like, and you probably know, but I'm not gonna say any names, but people when they're stressed out before games and then to see them through the, the change of the season where they're like, all right, they're just playing in their own zone, they're happy. And they're that's what's fun about football, not like the stress of it, the anxiety of it, uh, but just to see them when they're on the football field functioning at a high level, because they're prepared, because whatever they did, the X, Y, and Z did the little things right to, to create that environment for themselves. So um, I think that's the joy is, is way worth any type of stress that the coach that coaching can bring. How do you get a kid to kind of believe in himself or hold himself to a higher standard? Cause you, like you said that there's these kids that all want to, you know, I saw it as a player, like all these guys want to go to the NFL or they want to be the starting quarterback or they want to do this and that, but their actions don't, don't reflect that at all. How do you help guide a kid or show him that they're slipping up and they're not, doing what they're supposed to be doing to reach the goals that they claim they want to achieve. Yeah, I think the first and foremost, like I have a formula for building conf confidence that I believe in. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just something that I believe in. And the first thing about that is, is just being, they got to have passion, passion, and they have to be passionate about what they're doing. Right. So like, if, cause if they don't love it, if they're not willing to do anything for it. It's not going to work regardless. You know, they might get really good at it, but they'll never be great at it. And for you to get to the next level, you have to be great. You know, you have to have something that's going to make you great. So you got to be passionate. Um, the second thing I'd say is they got to then they got to be competent. Right. They have to 
they have to know what they're doing. They have to have a level of understanding about what they're doing so that they can in turn work hard at what they're trying to do. Right. So it's just that that's where I come in as a coach is I, I can help them kind of mind their or mend their those thought processes together to make them confident. Okay, this is how we do this. This is why I do this. This is what I'm doing when this happens. Uh, and then when obviously hard work that comes with the reps and then now you, you start seeing somebody do something a thousand times well on that thousand and first time they're they're going to be really really special at it and so that's usually what happens on your senior year you've spent three years really developing and getting right and getting the same reps over and over and over and then now your senior year you're flourishing that's the normal uh progression for a, a student athlete so uh but i think it all comes down to passion and then competency. And then just, are you willing to put the hard work after you figure out what to do? And then why are you ultimately doing it? Because it was before money and NIL and draft picks. There was a reason why you played football, whether that was to show how tough you were, whether because you thought it was super fun or just wanted to prove something to somebody. It didn't, it doesn't matter. There was always a why before it became a business, you know? When, when a kid is frustrated with their situation that is similar to, you know, situation that I was in, I was frustrated for three years. I wasn't playing, but how do you get them to kind of, kind of reframe their situation into going back to that passion of why they started playing the game in the first place. And that, you know, they shouldn't give up or they shouldn't try less or they need to work harder when they are frustrated. They're not seeing tangible results because everyone wants that tangible right. playing time catches, you know, stat book stuff but they're not getting that opportunity and what's the message to them in that situation when they are frustrated because we me and you had a very similar conversation to the question i literally just asked you yeah, yeah no doubt. last year so i know you you told me this directly but there's things that you just gotta keep working at yeah i, I well there's two things i'd say first is is control what you can control and that's easier said than done because as a player you want to aim so like you said, have something tangible. I want to see like a receipt on on my investment. I'm investing this time and I want I want some ROI. Yeah. Uh, but you can only control what you can control. And when you when you do that, you block out the distractions. You stop trying to play head coach. You stop trying to play GM, whatever the case may be. Because I again, this is all stuff that I've learned off personal experiences. I've been I have been that player where I thought about what uh what why what am I not doing to get this? I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I'm just I'm just as good as this guy. I'm not playing. And you know, there's pot there's things that are uh, that are always in play that you might not have a full understanding of. And if you just continue to progress and continue to work hard and continue to do it, well that will come that will your investment will come in in full. But just just control what you can control. Don't overthink the situation. And the second thing is is, you know, it's this game is built on mental toughness and it's, it is hard. That That is the probably the hardest thing because like you said, like there's a time where you'll want to pack it in because you're like, all right, well it is what it is. I, I, I've done everything I could do, but there's always more. There's always one more level, which is the amazing part of it. And I didn't really understand this until I got with Mark Tressman, who was my head coach at Toronto Argonauts. And he was super big on leadership and big on just, this, the psychology of football and the processes that you go through. But there's always another level. Like right now in today's society, there's so, it's so easy to just pack it in. But if you notice, like when guys just stay the course and they just show up every day and they're the same guy every day, eventually it becomes their turn, you know? And so like, just, there's always another level. You can all, if you just become the same guy every day, a consistent player, it will always turn out into your favor. But, um, you know, that's, that's, the hard part about it. That's why only 1% of college players play in the NFL. Only 1% of that 1% makes it to three years in the NFL because the stuff is, is hard. The mental processes are very difficult, you know? So, uh, but yeah, it's those two things, man. Control what you can control and then keep going, keep grinding and, and, and take the next step, whatever it might be. If, if you really love it, if you really want to do it, you'll take that next step. There's a quote that, that kind of just reminded me of like, it was this, uh, I think it was a UFC fighter, said, all your hard work will pay off. You just got to still be standing there when it does. That's, that's a great, that is a great quote. But that's the truth, though. It is. It's as, as I, cliche as it sounds. It is the truth. No, it is. Just be like, they, you know how many people have just won by default? Like, yeah, me. No, no BS. No BS. <laughs> looking like, at one. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same guy. I'm the same guy. It just, 
Like there, there's things I've won where I'm like, I'm probably not even that talented, but I know for a fact I'm not gonna quit. Like I won't tap out where other guys are all my hammy. I can't perform today. Like I'll be there. I'll drop two balls, but I'll be there and I'll be dependable because I'm gonna catch four, I'll drop two, and then shoot, hopefully I get a plus two rating. Right. Or whatever the case may be. And then eventually you'll learn how to catch six. And so, uh, but just just being present and, and just trying to put your best foot forward goes a long way, you know. And and so many people let their emotions get the best of them. And, you know, and it's unfortunate because that's that's the the beginning of the end for some guys, you know. You think talent forever, some guys like raw ability, the guy who can run the fastest, the guy who can jump the highest, the guy that has the natural ability to be, do you think at some point it becomes a detriment to them if they don't have the mentality? Yeah, yes and no. Uh, there's some talent that's just, it's it's supreme. Like, it don't matter how bad, it, like, it just, I'm going to take this guy because it's so, like, the speed is right, right now, speed, you can't, you just can't get guys faster. Like, they're either fast or they're not. You can't so coach you, speed. You can't coach it, right? So, um, there, there, are, there are detriments that come with that, but that's where good coaches come in and say, like, hey, I got to find a way to tap into this guy to get him to use, utilize some technique. It might not be – he'll never be just super technical, but if he could just have this little technique, it might help him do X, Y, and Z, and it usually does. But uh, I think in today's climate, I think it's very – it can be detrimental. It can be dangerous under the wrong guidance. Like a lot of high school kids – don't know how far away they are. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if you think about who you were as an 18 year old when you were, oh my god, <laughs> back in Chicago, yeah, it's just like you're not the same. You weren't even close to the same player, you know. And so, um, there's a lot of kids that come into the to this thing, and they're they do have a talent. They don't know what to do with it, and they just their whole life they've already they they they've been a one trick pony. They've been a gimmick player. Well, how do you become a well-rounded player? Because that's what college you have to do. Because everybody has that one trick. So then, what separates your trick from the from the next person? So, uh, learning how to become a well-rounded player is part of the process of becoming a great player, and then ultimately having a shot to play in the NFL. Uh, but you know, so it's a. It, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but it's it can be detrimental and it can be great because if they have the talent, then they that. There's some talent like LeBron James, 6'9", he can jump, he can do this, where it took him 20 years to develop into this player that he is today. Like, if you want, and you you were a baby at this time, but <laughs> LeBron James today is the is 10 times better of a basketball player than LeBron James when he was first in the league, first four or five years. And he was just good, just as good, averaging the same amount of points, but – this, he didn't need the skill side of it. He was just pure talent and just jumping over everybody, dunking, and occasionally knock down a shot. Where now it's you can see the true skill, the the, the fundamentals that have came into play through that twenty year career. Where they're now just starting to show like hey, this is what's keeping him afloat. This is what's keeping him at the highest level. So shout out to LeBron James. Yeah. <laughs> we'll tag him in this. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, tag him, please. <laughs> no, but uh, I see what you're saying. Like I think the talent thing is is yeah every. Everyone has some level of talent, whatever it is, and that thing they met at you know one percent or they might have a ton. But like I think what you you were saying is the people that can actually use the talent and then the mentality to add on to it, so add different abilities is what separates you know a talented player from like a a playmaker essentially. Right. Right. We've all seen that dude that that comes in who's got all the talent in the world but he cannot figure out the mental side of just being consistent and doing the little things right and being disciplined. Yep. And, and mentality, mentality is like the, all right. So I'd say if, if talent is the gas to a car, mentality is the steering wheel. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, you can yeah. go hundred miles an hour. I can pedal to the metal and I can go, but if I can't stay on the road, then what good is the car? So That's mentality good. is what guides you through all these things, you know? And so like, do you have the mental toughness? Are you confident? Are you super smart on the football field? Um, are you competitive, right? Because if you have those four things, then you probably have a chance to be really, really successful. Uh, and if you don't, okay, you, uh, hopefully you can get just one. Just get one of them, and then that'll just be just enough if you're that talented. There's guys who, who don't have any mentality and are super talented, and they're back home at the park because they just couldn't get – they didn't understand how to deal with the struggle side of it. Like the fact that you can't just run past anybody anymore. 
you have to have some technique. You have to learn how to restack, how to hold your line, how to catch it over the shoulder, you know, and, and, and uh, there's just so many different, every level is, is a different difficulty. And if you can learn how to deal with those things that with certain mentality, that's going to keep you on the road and keep you on the, the road to success. So, how do but yeah. You, I mean, how do you build mental toughness in a 18 to 20? Well, now nah, I guess you, you deal with 18 year olds to 25 year olds. I know. How do you, I mean, the, the, how do you build, what's the general principle of building mental toughness in a, in a, young man I, I personally i believe like mental toughness uh a large part has to do with just how you were raised and i don't like personally i don't i don't care if you make a million dollars or your dad or your mom made a million dollars or they made zero is just show me a kid that is a fighter like that's willing to fight i don't because the, the, the kids who are gonna fight for something that they want they're gonna have a level of success because they know there's a standard that they, they want to hold themselves to. But it's the kids that don't want to compete and the kids that don't want to fight that you just can't. It, it's a, it's not a dud, but it's just like it's gonna be really difficult because you've never gone anything, you've never had to fight through whatever, or you've never had to prove somebody wrong in this instance. So uh, I, I guess that's where it would start is you gotta look at the home life. You know, just figure out where where there was some struggle. Again, I've coached all types of different kids, and I've coached, and some of the richest kids were the best, most mentally tough kids in the world. And so it doesn't matter where you, what economic background you come from, just about whether or not you're willing to fight. So that's the first thing. Second thing I'd say is, um, there's times as a coach you have to be a different person for every kid, like. I can sometimes I can be a hard at, a hard ass on somebody because I know that's what he needs at the time. And then there's sometimes where they just need somebody just to shut up and listen. You know what I mean? And like just get that's why I always try to open my door and create an environment with my players of like whatever you got on your chest, just get it out right now so you can go about your day. Because if you're not, if it's going to continue to drain you, and then it's going to drain your performance. So um, I think you got to have somebody who is going to be there with you through a through a struggle and be patient. You know, uh, uh, going back to when I played, like there were times where I went through certain levels of uh, adversity and, and just struggling with certain things. And I had a lot of good coaches who were just patient with me. Like, hey, like you'll get through this. Just keep keep the course, keep doing what you're doing. I'm here. Get it out. Do whatever you got to do. And then we'll go about our business. So I think that that, that was very important for me. And then um, ultimately just. I guess thirdly, I'd say is, is, you know, when those moments come, you got to teach them to maximize and then you got to praise them. You got to like, you got to reward them. You got to show everybody in the room why it's important to go through this process, where this guy started it to where he's at now. And then why, how he got there. And it like, you know, it, I think it's really rewarding to see when it clicks for players. Like I said earlier, it's like, and those are the moments where it clicks. Cause if a kid can get through certain things like that, then he'll be successful in his life. Cause he's, when things come up, you know, hopefully it never does, but we all know it will. But when things come up and, and they're not in your favor, where you lose, you, you, you lose some money or somebody in your family gets sick and it's unexpected where now you can, all right, cool. I've done, I've felt this struggle, this stress before. I know how to get through this. We just have to continue to be the same guy every day and, and stay the course. So um, I think you gotta love him. They got to have some level of understanding of what's going on and, 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 you know, just trying your best to trying your best to reward them when, when they have success. I think it will ultimately get them tougher and they'll start understanding the correct way to respond to adversity. Yeah. One thing I feel like in the room when we, when I was playing, I think this is just natural for every player and coach relationship is like that. I appreciated and all the coaches and I would, I'm putting you in this group is like, you didn't, you don't like, you would never like, you would always listen, hear us out, but like you would never like lie to us or, you know, tell us something that wasn't, you know, the facts of the situation. Like it's one thing to be, you know, a listener, compassionate and understand, and then be like, this is the reality of what's going on of this situation. Like you just got to keep going or yeah. like, you just got to, you know, change this about your habits or change this about this. So, like I always appreciated that from a player's perspective, like, just upfront honesty in whatever the situation is. And then to your other point about like the mental toughness of athletics, I think 
as an athlete, it's prepared me for like just random things that pop up in life, like stuff that you wouldn't expect, stuff that you don't expect coming. And then it hits you. And then you're like, oh, I've been in a situation where I've had anxiety, stress because of my, you know, experience as a football player. Like I know exactly the mindset that's going to take to get me through this. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just, that's why football is such a great game because it's a microcosm of life. Like there's so many parallels of what, how football can translate into life. And, um, you know, ultimately that's why we all coach and what you learn as a player once you leave the game is like, dang, like this is really similar. Like, and even, even, even when I got into, excuse me, even when I got into the workforce, I got into sales and it was like, it was a cakewalk because the average day of an athlete is 10 times harder than an average day of corporate America. Now there's a lot of things that go on the line in corporate America that aren't in the same boat as, as a uh, athlete, but the, the mental stress, the, the adversity, the attention to detail, that's all the same. And if you're a high level achiever in the football field, you'll probably be a high level achiever off the field. You know, and um, I just, I, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of parallels to football in life. How important is like um, player coach relationship and the individuality of that? Like, yes, you, you, you were explaining how you have to coach everyone differently and you have to coach, you know, I'm a kid from a two parent home from upper middle class family on the, 30 minutes north of Chicago and a primarily, you know, I had three African-American kids in my high school. So like how <laughs> they were the best, some of the best players on the team. So yeah, no, no doubt. But then you have, you know, kids that are from the inner city that have a single parent. How, how hard is it to balance the styles and the communication that you have to have to communicate effectively to each individual? while also addressing it as a group? Because there is kind of a duality of it. Uh, I think that's a great question. I think the best way to put it, and everyone has their own style. Uh, I'm biracial myself. So I have, my dad is black. My mom is white. Uh, so I, my entire life, I've had the luxury of being able to talk with both and understand people from every economic situation, social situation. Uh, so I've had a lot of, I guess, experience with, with everybody. And so I think that's a plus in my, on my behalf when I deal with kids, because I understand what they're going through to a sense. Um, I think what I try to do is I try to make football the main thing. So the standard is the standard that doesn't change for anybody. Like I can't just because you grew up with no dad doesn't mean that you can't make this block. Does that make sense? I don't give football is football. So I keep that the main thing. Um, I think there is some, level of degree difference when I speak with somebody with that comes from a two parent home. Okay. Well, what kind of two parent home was, is dad like a hard ass on his kid? Because if he is, then I can be a hard ass on him. If he's never gone through, he's never been yelled at his entire life. Well, then I can't speak to him the same because, or I will, I'm going to, I'm going to always be me, but I'm going to understand that the first time I do that, he's going to shell up or he'll, he's not going to react how I want him to. And then this is where being patient as a coach, you have to understand like, he won't, he's going to take it personal first and then he'll grow to understand. Like, I know I'm just, this is who he is every day. And then once you're, if you're that guy, if you're often, if you're very authentic as a coach, then people have a tendency to understand and won't take it personal. I think when you, when you speak to kids who come from a certain background where they may not have had two parents in their home, um, not every, every kid is, is the same in that situation because like, okay, well, they didn't have a dad in the house, but the coach was tough on him. So now I can I can yell at him the same way I would. I can coach him how I want to. Um, where where you have problems at is, I think you got to figure. I always have to figure out um, what makes the kid go, what makes him like. Ultimately, what does the kid want, and then what's going to make him go? Because every kid, like almost every kid, is a pleaser. Like they all want to do well. They don't want to have negative experiences associated with football. No one likes getting yelled at, but then it's just teaching them how to respond. So like most of the, you've seen it, you've seen me do it. Like I'll yell at somebody and then I'll come and love them up. Cause like, I have to do it. Cause I got to teach you how to be a good football player. A good football player gets yelled at and fixes it the next rep. Right. That's what a good football player does. And every most, 
95% of the football players learn that same experience. Like, I remember the first time I got yelled at, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why am I getting talked to like that? You know what I mean? Like, I, I know I've been doing things right my whole life. Like, I get here and I'm messing up. But uh, when you when you learn to do that, when you learn to take coaching and turn it into a positive measure and not take it personal, uh, it, it helps you out just as far as, like we said, being building that toughness of like, okay, I can – handle a high pressure situation. I can handle people freaking out around me and still be able to perform. Uh, and so it just, like, we're always trying to search for that composure level. Uh, at least I am. So I try to get my kids to, to do that, but just to answer your question, I think each kid is different. You got to figure out what's, what makes them go, but you want to, I always hold football as the standard. The standard is always the standard. It don't change. It doesn't flex for anybody. I don't care if, you don't have a dad. I don't care if you don't have a mom or your mom and dad abandoned you or they're, they're, they're the lo most loving parents in the world. The standard is always going to be the standard. We're going we're gonna to play football one way, and that's the, at the highest level with all the effort and all the understanding that we have to have. And then as people, we will learn to grow and take steps as necessary. So I just, I, like I said, I try to keep football the main thing. Man. There's so much psychology that I didn't know went into college football or just – athletics in general until I got to um, Miami and I was like half of this is like a mental health counseling session and half of this is you know actually teaching someone like how the game works and like as a coach it's just got to be even like as like an older player when you're like because sometimes you know players come to players before they'll go to a coach to like talk about or hash out things so it's like you got to be you got to wear multiple hats as a coach I feel like yeah all the time I mean you're probably 10% of the time you're actually a coach, you know, like you're, you're an academic counselor, you're a therapist, you're a big brother, you, you know, you're, you're a man of many hats, but um, I mean, it's fun. Like that's the, that's the cool thing is just, like I said, there's no reward to other than there's no reward, like seeing a kid who you, they don't have it figured out. They're struggling, and then it just clicks, and then they become. They're just stepping to the to who they are supposed to be, and they and they wear it, you know. And like I, I wasn't there for Jack, but from what I understand, that was a very similar story for him of him. And I, th I think that's what you do. That's what you get into coaching for. Is like watching a guy. He's like Bambi. He can't walk, can't do anything, and then he just flourishes into this guy, and he's a dude. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, I think it's really cool. But I. I Again, I'm going back to Mark Trestman. Like, you think the psychology side of it is crazy, but the meticulous side of it is even crazier. Like, where got coaches will do certain things to certain guys just to see how they respond and then to build on that. And yes. I think that's it. It's kind of sick, but it's like <laughs> it's. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> no, but I think it it's it's needed though. That's the oh, thing. Yeah. Like, and, and so when I like I said, I, I Mark Trestman was the key like the king of it like he was so big on leadership and he's like hey i'm on i'm on your ass because this is who i need you to be and i can't get you there if you don't understand why you're getting there and why i'm doing this so uh you know it's i think that's the mark of a good coach is when they can be 15 steps ahead like i'm doing this now and it sucks for him right now but in in 10 months this guy's going to be a completely different dude and the dude that we need for this team you know I never knew that, that coaches did that a little bit, like, cause of high school, like I had a different experience in high school with coaches, but like, I didn't realize this until like my sophomore year, like coaches will literally like test a kid so far mentally to be like, if I can frazzle you in practice, like you are screwed in a game. Mm -hmm. no doubt. I didn't know that was a thing until I had a coach explain it to me. They weren't doing it to me, but I was like watching them like get after this dude. I was like, if I can heat you up and make you anxious during practice, like I, that shouldn't be the first time in the game. No, but it, th that's the truth though. Like, cause think about all the snaps that you play, just how frantic some of them are where you're like, <laughs> there's so many things that can go haywire. And if you freeze up, if you freak out, what, you know, how is your response? And so if you can control your emotions on the practice field or getting yelled at, the chances are you're going to control your emotions when things, when all the live bullets are flying across your head, you know? So, um, there's definitely some, some, some chess being played as coaches to players, but, um, you know, it's always good to see them respond positively. It sucks when they don't ever figure it out. And those, that certainly does happen too, is where 
guys just never understand it. And then it just becomes a downhill spiral from there, you know, and, and that's the unfortunate side of it. With this, the new landscape of college football and just, you know, college athletics and kind of young men in general, what are some of the challenges that you see young men facing in today's world? Because you, you're in an interesting role because you deal with, you know, 18 to 22 year old men every day and you see challenges broadly. So what are some of those things that those kids face and young men face today? I, I don't want to. I'm going to say this. I don't want to sound old when I say this because that's what all older people do. It's like, well, the younger, this is what's wrong with younger generation. But I I would say the, the thing that seems like to be the biggest struggle point right now is that kids want instant gratification. That's the biggest thing. Like, and it's, and you can blame social media, you can blame whatever you want, but that's what it is right now is kids think that they're going to walk in the day they get here and they're going to be the superstar of the team. And then they're going to spend three years in college and go to the NFL and then do the same rinse, wash, repeat the process. And that's just not the case for 99.9% of the college freshmen that enroll. Uh, and so I think that's the biggest problem from a football standpoint. I think from a societal standpoint is we're losing our edge, I would say, as a society. Like there, there was a part of being a man and part of, being a definitely part of being a father is is there's a line and I'm gonna draw that line in the sand and I gotta stand my ground on this line no matter what no it don't matter how it affects certain things I have to stand my ground on this line and I think that line just keeps getting pushed further and further back and uh, it's, it's it's just driving people to be softer uh, and I again I hate saying it like I'm this old guy because I'm not I'm still like I'm like in that transitional period I'm not young but I'm not old. So that's the uh, best period. I know it's been great. It's been, it's the golden <laughs> years for sure. But I, I like I said, I, I just, I do think we're getting softer as a generation. Uh, and a part like the work ethic that goes into being successful is part of the, the joy that you feel when you do make it because all the time, all the effort that you, you know, put into it is, is worth it. So like I go, th this is my second career. And so I love the I love the phase that I'm in right now because I'm year one to now I'm going on year five. Like I'm just building and I love it because I know when I'll hopefully whenever I meet whatever goal I want to get to, I'll be like, dang, like I love those years. I met I met great people. I worked with great people. I kept my cool the whole time. Like it was great. Versus when I was 18 to 22, I was freaking out. I was partying all the time, got kicked out of school, went to JUCO in Mississippi. Then I went to had to go to Louisiana to go play ball. Like all those trials and tribulations help ultimately make it feel 10 times better. But um, I think if, if, if we can learn as a society, just to build, enjoy the process rather than the result, uh, I think we will be in better shape. And so I try to tell my guys that as much as possible, you know, this, yeah. um, just enjoy it. Cause when it's gone, it's gone. And as you know, because no, you're not, you're not playing football, you know, but at the same time, you know, I bet you there's times you look back and you're like, dang, I kind of, I kind of do miss the workouts. Like I don't miss the game. The game is the game, like, but the workouts, the, the locker room, the, the small things that you took for granted because you were focused on what, how many snaps you were going to get in this game or how many, how many targets you were going to get in this game. Uh, I think that, you know, that, that goes commonly unsaid. So. Yeah. So I just absolutely enjoy love that. Like uh, I think a lot of things go hand in hand. Like you said, football is a microcosm of life. And I think that a lot of things in, in society nowadays, and especially with young young men, I can point back to, you know, situations and things that I went through with football that I've now noticed that people are struggling with today that never had that, never had to see something through. And they never had to dedicate themselves to something bigger than who they were. And, you know, you, you when you play football, yeah, you're you're trying to, do well for yourself and you know but you're also dedicating yourself to a program and you're dedicating yourself to your teammates and I think what you said about delayed or instant gratification I think it's 100% affecting people my age um, and even older and younger just like everyone <laughs> sees the stuff on Instagram as like oh like you see you know someone have a crazy highlight on Instagram and it's 30 seconds Right. You know, he had a crazy one-hand catch. But you didn't see 
the hours and hours and hours of grinding in the weight room, grinding in on the practice field, which is the same thing for business. Everyone wants to be, you know, the $100 million company, but no one saw the dude staring at his computer, working on it, staring at Excel spreadsheets till 3 a.m. every night. Everyone sees, right. you know, the nice clothes. Um, so it's just, it's just different now. And I noticed that with, with guys at, in college, especially they, 